Hello students, welcome to Smen and Eggs again. This is uh, Learning Plan 2, Part 1. Okay? So let's talk about, we're still in course competency 3, reclassify aggregate properties using concrete and asphalt mixtures. Okay, so in here, the last learning plan, we did these top two. Now we're going to discuss aggregate index properties. And then we're going to, eventually we're going to end up doing perform aggregate index property testing. Okay, so as I was saying in lab this week, aggregates is the backbone, it's the structure of concrete. So we want to make sure the aggregates are good of what we're using for the concrete and asphalt. Okay, so pay attention. Things may be on the quiz. All right. So let's talk about weight, weight of aggregates. So we have something called heavyweight aggregate, which is greater, greater than 130 pounds per cubic foot. Um, I have a cubic foot box in my lab. I can show you so you can kind of visualize what a cubic foot looks like. Okay. I have normal weight. We have normal weight, which is 75 pounds per cubic foot to 110 pounds per cubic foot. And then we have lightweight, which is typically less than 75 pounds per cubic foot. Okay, so typically where we are in Dolomite in Green Bay, Wisconsin, sediments, we're, we're in this range. Where you get the heavy weight is in the mining areas where we have a lot of heavy metals or magnetite and hematite, especially in the UP. So we'll get over 130 pounds per cubic foot. And then lightweight will be uh, like the volcanic rock, they call it pumice. So it's very, uh, lots of air voids. Okay, soundness is another aggregate index property. So soundness, the ability of an aggregate to withstand weathering. And the big, big guy, weathering, you know, wet, wet, dry, wet, dry, hot, cold. And the big one is freeze-thaw. Why freeze-thaw? Because um, from basic physics, we know that when water freezes, it expands. Okay, so when water will get in, I'll use my little... Laser point. So when water seeps in, aggregates are porous. So when water, when they are wet and it freezes, the, the pressures will actually pop apart the aggregate. So soundness is a very important aggregate property. Particle strength is another property that we want. Aggregate particle able to withstand load without breaking. Okay. So like on a, a base course road, an aggregate road, or they call it gravel roads. You know, we have a lot of tires, forklift traffic, um, especially in warehouses and concrete. We want to make sure the load from that tire being transferred to the aggregate, it doesn't, it doesn't break apart. So particle strength. So we have weak particles. Okay. It's another property. Toughness. Ability to withstand abrasion and impact. Okay. Abrasion and impact. So abrasion. Think about the snowplow going down the road. Okay, that snowplow blade is is scraping across the road. That's abrasion, right? Think about a warehouse, concrete, a warehouse with um, forklifts going all, all over the all, like, all over the the warehouse all the time. That's abrasion impacts. You know, um, this vehicle is impacting. So how do we know about toughness? So it's a machine called LA abrasion machine. Literally, we, what we do is we'll run a sieve analysis before we run it through the the um, LA, LA abrasion steel. We put that same sample in in this steel drum and put some steel balls in it, and we'll run it. And basically, what that is doing is that will abrasion impact, and the, the particles will fall apart. And then once the uh, certain amount of time is done, then we'll take it out and run another another gradation, so we can compare the original to the new, and then we'll we'll measure what's on each of the sieves, and we can tell the percentage of the uh, toughness of those aggregates. So toughness is important. Shear strength, friction and interlocking between aggregate particles. Okay, so remember me saying in learning plan one, we have natural gravel with rounded faces, right? And then we, then we have uh, manufactured gravel, right? Which is we run it through a crusher, okay? And we want to create angular faces, okay? So think about throwing a, a bowl full of marbles on the floor. They want to roll all over the place, don't they? So do you think there's a lot of friction when you when you step on it? We're going to slip, all right? Now, if you take those marbles and we break them up into pieces, are they going to roll all over the floor? No, okay, right? And then if we also 
also, if you step on them when they're broken apart, you're not going to slip either. So we that that's what we want. We need good shear strength. That's why we want crushed gravel. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't think of the term. So crushed gravel. That's why we want crushed gravel. We want to create those angular faces so we can create friction and interlocking. Okay. So how do we get that? So we'll talk about later as we can get a well graded aggregate. Well graded means multiple sizes. Okay. So not all the same size, larger particle size, flat, broken faces, rough surfaces, and compaction, okay? So well-graded, um, if you kind of look at this picture right here, you can kind of see well-graded, I mean, there's multiple sizes in here, right? Because it'll fill in all the voids so we can get that particle on particle contact. Larger particle size, okay, that'll hold more, more load, okay? Flat broken faces, so we kind of like this. That'll help interlock all these particles together. Rough surfaces, so it's just like sliding your foot across the carpet. You got to push pretty hard, right? So now you take that same foot, and now you go you go on ice, right, or or marble. It there's no rough surface, so it's gonna slide. So compaction, just like building a sandcastle. How do you build a sandcastle? Can you just take Take a, a bucket full of sand and just dump it over, and then the sand castle is going to stand up. No, you got to take time. You got to put the sand down. You got to take your hands and compact it. So, what is that doing? That is pushing all these particles together, right? And we're creating that friction and interlocking so the sand castle stands up. So, th these these are very important things, and we we will do lots of tests on these, okay? To determine this if an aggregate is suitable for that. Sometimes we, we don't have it, okay? So we may have to make it to get what we need for good concrete. Transmit compressive force. So if you look, that wheel is sitting there, okay? So that force goes to this aggregate, and then it goes to this aggregate, and this aggregate, and so forth. So the load, they call it a load transfer, actually goes through the entire concrete structure, okay? So you can imagine what I was saying. A aggregate holds up nine of a majority of the load, okay? So if we have a gap right here, and all of a sudden that load is transferred to the cement paste, the cement paste can't hold as much as the aggregate. So we may have some cracking there. So that's why compaction and well-graded, we all these particles are touching, so that load transfer keeps going throughout the entire thickness of the concrete, okay? So... We want aggregates that can transmit compressive force, okay? This is kind of similar to particle strength. So if that force comes, it doesn't, points don't break off, and all of a sudden, you know, it starts crushing, okay? So that's another property. All right. So this, so good properties, what we want. So we want soundness, freeze thaw, particle strength, resist breaking. We want good tough particles. We resist abrasion and impact. We want good shear strength. Okay. And we want to be able to transmit compressive force. Those are good index properties. Now let's talk about what we don't want in concrete or the aggregates that we don't want in concrete. So we're going to call those deleterious aggregate index properties. Bad. Okay. Friable particles. Material that is easily crumbled. So there is actually bedrock out there that you actually, you could pick it up and it's so soft, you can crush it in your hand. So they call that friable, like sandstone, loosely um, um, embedded sandstone. Sometimes you get those seams in between our dolomite layers in, in Green Bay, especially near Bondo Well on 29, when you look at the, the rock cliffs there, the bedrock cliffs, there's actually, we, we call it sandy dolomite because there's sand and dolomite kind of mixed together. So we don't want that. So do, dolomite, our particles, we can get a lot of these fry, fry, friable particles because it was it's organic. It was organisms that just died and settled to the bottom of the ocean. So sometimes they don't have enough time to compress. Okay. P200. P stands for passing. Remember, P200 is 0 0.075 materials passing. That's the silt in the clay. Okay. They can coat the car particles. Remember, so when you're trying to... They use those 3M sticky strips to hang something on the wall. The first thing they say is to clean the surface. 
what we're doing is we're getting the dust off, right? So the, the adhesive is sticking to the wall and not the dust, and then the thing falls off. Kind of goes same with silt and clay. The material defines, not fine aggregate, fines passing the number 200 sieve. That'll coat the particles, right? And then the cement we will not bond to the actual aggregate particle. It will bond to the, um, the fines, okay? Now we have soft particles. These two are very similar. Soft particles, we can't break under, they're not friable, we can't break them with our hands, but they'll break really easy under loading. So a lot of that, those could be chert. So we get a lot of chert, which is a form of limestone in, in the dolomite area here. It's really soft, it doesn't hold a lot, it can't hold a lot of weight. Okay, lightweight pieces. Okay, so material that has a low specific gravity and is porous. So coal, lignite, and shirt. Low specific gravity. From physics, specific gravity is the relationship of the unit weight of that material to the unit weight of water. Okay, the specific gravity of water is one. So if we have a specific gravity, gravity of greater than one, we will be sinking. The, the aggregate will sink. If we have a specific gravity of less than one, the aggregate will float. Okay? So specific gravity. All right? So the specific gravity of our dolomite in this area is around 2.65. Around there, 2.6. So basically 2.6 times heavier than water. Okay? There is a special test that we could do. Um that if we have lightweight aggregates, lightweight pieces, coal, lignite, and chert. Um, so if we run a special test, actually a soft particle, these, it, it could be a friable particle and a soft particle, and most likely it's a lightweight piece, okay? And then the last thing, so we can kind of see this picture right here. That's a piece of chert in the concrete, so it's lightweight. It's very absorbent, and it, this is called a pop-out. So the concrete popped out because the water got in and it froze. This is a piece of chert. Okay. And then the last thing is organic impurities. It could be in the mixing water. It could just be coat, the fines coating the rocks. Um, it could affect the cement paste. It could uh, chemically affect the cement paste. Reactive aggregates. Okay. Aggregates that contains... Minerals that react with alkalis in Portland cement causing expansion of concrete. Okay, so that is called, uh, there's a reaction known to this area is called silica alkali reaction. Okay, I had the opportunity to, to core all the dams on the Fox River all the way from Lake Winnebago up to the Bay of Green Bay. Okay, so what was happening, those dams were built in the early 1900s and they're starting to, <laughs> They were starting to look like this. Um, what we found when we, we actually took um, core samples of the walls of the dams at, at certain spots by just visual inspection, we noticed these dams were deteriorating, okay? So by taking the cores, what we, what we found is we, we did some specialized tests and we found that the aggregates back then contained a lot of um, alkalis in it. You know, especially uh, lime, you know, the dolomite and the cherts, and it was reacting with the cement. So back in the 1900s, we didn't have any quality control. They just used aggregates, what was right there by that dam at that time, just to create this dam. Okay. So what we did is we actually did a test to see how much longer the silica, silica alkali reaction would, would last. Okay. So... Basically, that's what happens. So what it does, it, it just, it's a chemical reaction, and over many, many years, it just slowly breaks apart the concrete. So when you're walking down the sidewalk or you're looking at concrete, foundation walls, anything like that, so if you see that kind of cracking, it's, it's a slow progression. Sometimes you see minor cases. Sometimes you see severe cases. Okay, So uh, that's what silicon reactive aggregates are. Okay. And then hydrophilic aggregate. Aggregate that has an affinity for water that prevents bonding with asphalt binders such as quartzite and chert. So there is uh, an aggregate, especially quartzite. Quartzite is prevalent in the Wausau area. There's 
Rib Mountain. Everybody heard of Rib Mountain or Granite Peak? So that's a uh, quartzite um, bedrock. So they tried crushing it and using it in asphalt. So what happens is, due to the chemical reaction, it actually loves water. So it actually bonds water around it. So what happens then, if there's water around it, the cement paste or the asphalt will not stick to the aggregate. There's like a little thin sheer surfaces and then the thing falls apart. So hydrophilic means attracts water, okay? Hydrophilic, not, okay? All right, let's talk about aggregate moisture conditions, okay? So an aggregate is porous, okay? If you pick up a rock, you cannot see those pores, okay? So when we say oven dry, okay, or dry, that means we're assuming there's absolutely no moisture within the little tiny pores inside that we can't see or around. That is called oven dry, oven, <laughs> oven dry, okay? All right, then we got saturated surface dry, SSD. The surface of the aggregate particle is dry. So basically what we do is we will we'll soak it in water, we'll pull it out of the water, and we'll pat it dry with a towel. So that means there's no water on the surface, okay? But the pores of the aggregate are filled with water, okay? Kind of see the pores are filled, right? So that's saturated surface dry, SSD. All right, and then there's wet. The pores of the aggregate are filled with water and there's free moisture on the surface of the particle. So they call this free moisture on the outside of the surface, okay? So why, why do you need to know moisture conditions, all right? So if I need to mix, uh, um, let's say 10 cubic yards of concrete and it requires uh, 10 pounds of water, Okay, if my aggregate is oven dry, the first, so, so that 10 pounds of water is required to completely hydrate that cement. If the aggregate is oven dry, the first thing that's going to happen, it's going to take some of, the, some of the 10 pounds of water and suck it into the, the pores to, to make it SSD. Okay, so now we may only have eight gallons or eight pounds of water that's trying to mix up that concrete, you know, the cement and the concrete, okay? So that will have to add more water, okay? All right, so ideally, we, we want, we're we trying to figure out what the saturated surface dry is. Remember, the pores are filled with water, but the surface is dry. So now if my aggregate is saturated surface dry, and I add my 10 pounds of water, I will have 10 pounds of mixing water because none of the water will be sucked in. All right. Okay. Now let's say it rains for 20 days and 20 nights, right? And aggregate, is, as you know, is outside all the time. Okay. It's raining. So now the aggregates are wet. Okay. Now my cement only needs 10, my cement mixture only needs cement. See, I told you not to say that. My concrete mixture only needs 10 pounds of water. Now, if I, if I don't take in consideration that the aggregate's wet, I could have up to 15 pounds of water in there because there's free water on the outside of that, of that aggregate. And then what that is going to do is actually dilute the cement, okay? And it's gonna make it a runny pancake mix, okay? So this is why you need to understand the difference in the moisture conditions of aggregates. Oven dry, okay? saturated surface dry and wet okay there for it to be oven dry there's physically no way an aggregate pile that has that's sitting outside even in the desert can be oven dry there will always be water so we're always between oven dry and saturated surface dry okay if it rains for a long long time or the aggregate sitting underwater we're, we could be between saturated surface dry and wet only way we're going to get dry is if it was actually put in an oven and dried out, okay? All right. So this is called a phase diagram. So as we um, aggregate soil, okay, 
has three components, three phases. We have the air, which is the, the pore space, right? The air is the pore space, right? This is all air, okay? We have water, oops. We have water, volume, okay? All right, and then we have solid. So no matter what, there are always these three phases of a piece of aggregate. If I'm looking at a single aggregate, there, all three exist most of the time. All right, let me explain. Let me uh, uh, um, expand on that, okay? So if my aggregate is oven dry, that means we have no water, right? The water was evaporated out. That means the volume of my air went up. So the volume of air when I'm oven dry is volume of air plus the volume of water. Okay. And then the volume of solids and the weight of solids, this will never change. The solid, the literally the volume, if we could physically somehow measure the volume of that, the solid particles, it will not change no matter what phase we're in. Volume of solids, weight of solids will be the same. The volume of air can change, but the weight of air will never change because the weight of air is zero. So depending on our moisture condition, the, the weight of water and the volume of water can change if we go from SSD to wet, okay? So looking at that, we have air, water, solids, okay? All right, so water content, moisture conditions, they call this water content or moisture content equals the weight of the water divided by the weight of the solids times 100. And that'll be in a percentage. Okay. So how do we calculate the weight of water? We take the total weight of the sample and we subtract the weight of the solids. All right. So let's think about this. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an empty container called a tear. I'm going to take a shovel full of um, aggregate from the beach. I'm going to put it in the tear, okay? And then I'm going to weigh, weigh the tear and the wet aggregate, okay? So I was, we need to know the weight of the empty container, correct? All right, so that'll be my total weight. Minus the tear will give me my total weight of my solids, right? Or the total weight of the sample. That would be water plus solid. Then I'm going to take that container and I'm going to put it in the oven. Okay. Now the total weight's going to disappear. It's going to change, right? Because what does the oven do? It evaporates the water. So that means this water turns the air. So that means we just have weight of solids. So I know the weight of water was, because it evaporated, was total weight minus the weight of solids. So we weigh it dry. So we weigh it wet. We weigh it dry. Subtract the two. We know how much water was in there. Then we do, then we know the weight of solids, and we divide by the weight of solids times 100. We have a they call it a water content or moisture content. All right. So let's do this example. All right. So these are tears, tins, containers. Okay. So weight of moist sample plus tear. All right, so weight of oven dry sample plus tear, weight of tear. So the first thing you do when you want a water kind, and we'll be running these in the lab, is you're going to grab a tear, get, uh, make sure it's clean and dry, and you're going to weigh it on a scale and get the weight of the tear, 26.34 grams, okay? Now I'm going to go take my sample, and my, my moist sample, moist or wet, interchangeable terms, and I'm going to fill it up and make sure there's nothing laying on the side so it doesn't um, doesn't fall off. I'm going to weigh it wet, and that weighed 165.04 grams. I'm going to put it in the oven, okay, or put it on a hot plate. I'm going to let it dry, okay. Now I'm going to weigh it again. So weight of oven dry sample plus tear is 147.26 grams. Okay. So how I solve this problem? Here's my formula. These are kind of the steps that I expect to see if I'm asking for written work when you do a quiz. What the formula, water content percentage equals weight of water divided by weight of solids times 100. 
Then what you're going to do is you're going to define each variable. Weight of water equal W, big W equals weight, little w means water, equals weight of water, which equals 165.04 grams minus 147.26 grams. Okay. So if you look, if I take the tear minus the tear, don't those cancel each other out? So that's why I can just take this number minus this number because 10 minus 10 is zero, right? Because if I do distributive math, so my weight of water is 17.78 grams. You know how many decimal places? Okay, weight of solids. So now I just, my weight of oven dry sample plus tear. Okay, this is my weight of solids, but now I have to subtract my tear because I got to get the tear weight off of there. So 147.26 minus my weight of my tear. So my weight of solids is 120.92 grams. Now, step four, I can plug and chug into the formula. 17.78 grams, weight of water, divided by weight of solids times 100, and I get 14.70%. Notice the decimal places. Two decimal places, 14.70%. So that's... A water content. So you're going to be doing this over and over and over again in lab. You're going to be doing it next semester in soil mechanics. So it's imperative that you understand this this calculation. Okay. So we'll be physically performing this in lab. So I'll be going over this again. Um, this example. I think I have another example in Blackboard. So if you just want to practice it, just change these numbers up and just try to. I'm gonna. You you need to memorize this. You'll need to know how to do this by by the top of your head. This is probably the only one that you'll have to. Okay. So just practice this. Change the numbers and just practice running through the steps so you can get a, a moisture content. All right. So one last thing we'll talk about, and then we'll be done with part one. Absorption is the percentage of weight of water needed to fill the pores. SSD, weight, number, saturated surface dry, saturated surface dry, the pores are filled, but the surface of the aggregate is dry, minus the oven dry weight, compared to the oven dry weight. The oven dry weight is weight of solids of the aggregate. Absorption is simply the water content at which aggregate is in an SSD condition. SSD, saturated surface dry. All right, so... Basically, when I am, from the previous slide, when I am figuring out a water content, that is including the water that is in the pores and outside the pores. Okay? So, we need to know how much of that water is actually being sucked into the aggregate. Remember that case where if I'm dry of SSD, some of that mixed water is going to be sucked into the aggregate. Then we got to add more mixed water. Okay? So absorption, basically, water content of absorption, so that is the weight of water only sucked into pores, plus the weight water content of the free water equals the total water content. Okay, so this will, later in the semester when we do concrete mix design, that we'll, we'll sh this will make sense and how we calculate this, okay? Because typically we can run a, a water content all right, and then we can figure out an absorption rate. Absorption rate is literally a percentage, a water content percentage, okay? So with that, we are done with this recording.